when we have a conductor, electrons are relatively free to move about that conductor. We have an insulator, that's not the case. If we have extra electrons on that conductor or in that conductor, then those extra electrons are going to repel each other. So we're not talking right now about all of the electrons in this conductor. We're talking about the extra. If you have a million protons, you have a million and five electrons. If you have 60,000 uh, protons, then you got 64,000 electrons. You've got more electrons than protons. Those extra electrons will repel each other, push each other apart, until the force of repulsion caused by one electron on another one is equal to some other force of repulsion of some other electron on this one. So in other words, until the forces balance. When the forces balance, the repulsive forces balance, then we reach this point that we call static equilibrium. Balanced forces, static equilibrium. That's the point at which all the extra electrons have actually come to rest. They've stopped. They've stopped moving around because they don't have to move around anymore. The forces that are repelling them apart from each other are all balancing now. At what point does this static equilibrium occur? In other words, what does the charge distribution of electrons look like in these conductors in order for, these, uh, in order for this static equilibrium to occur? Well, the first diagram that we saw yesterday was when we had a solid conducting sphere. In other words, a ball. A solid ball, not a hollow ball, a solid ball that's made of some kind of conducting material like steel, like copper. Okay? It could be anything, any metal, basically, that's a good conductor. We saw yesterday that if we have three extra electrons, as you see in this diagram, okay, then those extra electrons will all repel each other to the outer surface. Remember the net force yesterday on all three of these? cause these electrons all to be pushed to the outer surface. Now, if you had 50 electrons there, the same analysis would apply. You just have 50 arrows acting on each, 50 forces acting on each uh, electron as opposed to three. So we've got a force of repulsion or multiple forces of repulsion acting on all of these electrons, which push them to the outer surface. Quick question for you. I asked this yesterday. I'll ask it again here. Why, when these electrons get to the outer surface, right here, do they stop? Why do they not go, why do they not keep going just into the air, like out here and just float away? Simon? Good. The air is an insulator and the electrons don't want to go to the insulator. Hey, I asked that question, but it's a bit of a loaded question because the reality is they can sometimes go beyond that. If the air is damp, if the air is moist, Right? It's a better conductor, and that's when you're going to get the electrons leaving. If you have too many electrons building up here on the surface, then they repel each other so much that it doesn't matter if you have an insulator. They're still going to, some of them at least, will still discharge, will still leave into the, uh, uh, into the air. That's arcing, right? That's discharging. Okay, when you walk across the carpet and you build up a charge on the tip of your finger and you touch somebody else on the finger, the electrons jump. Why do they jump? Because you had too many of them built up on the tip of your finger. And they're repelling each other so much that they'll still go into the, into the uh, insulator. They'll still go into the air. But for the most part, okay, as Simon said, they're going to stop when they get to that barrier, that insulator, that uh, conductor insulator boundary okay, between the ball and the air. They go to the outside. They always go to the outside. What's the distribution look like? What's the distribution look like? But they're pretty evenly spaced, aren't they? In fact, they're exactly evenly spaced. If we have uh, literally just electrons on the outer surface, they're going to be exactly evenly spaced. That's the point at which the forces will balance out. If they're not evenly spaced, then the forces won't balance, and it won't be in static equilibrium, and they're going to keep moving around until they are. The next diagram we have looks a lot different, but the analysis that we apply is pretty similar, actually. If you look at the first diagram here, uh, especially this middle, this middle electron here, we'll call it charge number two, it experiences a force of repulsion caused by number three to the left. It experiences a, for, a force of repulsion caused by number one to the right. So this is going to be F3, two. This is going to be F1, two. The force of one on two is bigger because one is closer to two than three is to two. 
So, what happens to this electron as a result of those two forces there? What happens to this electron as a result of these two forces? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pushed to the right because F12 is bigger, right? It goes in the direction of the bigger force, so it moves to the right. But as it moves to the right, F12 becomes a smaller force, and F32 becomes a bigger force. At some point, they're going to balance each other out. Okay, that's the point where it's in static equilibrium. When does that happen? When that charge reaches the middle. So what do we find about this one? Just the same as the last one. The charges go to the outer surface, and the charges are evenly spaced. Finally, this is the last one we did yesterday. When we have an irregular shape or a pointy thing, it's your finger when you're walking across the carpet and you go to shock somebody. It's the lightning rod on the top of a building. You have a pointy thing. Take a look at this particular. Let's look at one, two, and three extra electrons. Number one pushes number two to the right. Number three pushes number two up this way. But the force of three on two has two components. There's this one, we'll call it the x, even though it's not really on the x-axis, we'll call this one the y component. The x component of the force of three on two and the force of one on two are on the same axis. So they oppose each other. That means that this guy right here, charge number one, pushes number two outwards, but three kind of pulls it inwards away from the tip. But this force is bigger, so it moves outwards. The charge moves outwards towards the tip. It moves to the surface because of the y component of the force of three, but it moves towards the tip because of the x component. As it moves outwards, this force right here, the x component of the force caused by number one, gets smaller. At some point, these two forces will balance, and that's the point at which it's in static equilibrium, and the charges remain at rest. The difference between this diagram and the last two that you saw is that in this diagram, although the charges still go to the outer surface, this time the charges aren't evenly distributed. They're more concentrated right here at the tip than they are anywhere else. That's why sometimes you use a static ball, okay, the, the Van der Graaff generator. Okay, some doesn't always work, and I think the day that we did it didn't hear this, but sometimes on you know, if all the conditions are perfect, the person with their hand on the static ball can, can take the other hand, point their finger, and move their finger around, and you can literally hear them moving their finger around. Because there's such a buildup of charge in their finger, in that finger that they're moving around, that it ends up discharging to the air. And you can hear it. That's why that happens with your finger, is because the concentration of charge at the tip is much greater than the concentration of charge anywhere else. Okay. All right, here's a new one. Although it's pretty similar to the first one that we did. Here's when we have a hollow conducting object. Well, first of all, the electrons aren't going to be in the middle, right? The electrons are in the conductor, which is pretty much the surface to begin with. What happens to them? Well, the same analysis really applies as the first diagram that we saw, the electrons push each other apart. Okay? Uh, this guy is pushed by this guy and this guy. This one is pushed by this one and this one, and so on. So they all get pushed not to the surface, but to the outer surface. Okay, this is a pretty thin, pretty thin uh, ball or a pretty thin hollow conducting sphere. They're all going to be basically on the surface even from the beginning. But when they reach static equilibrium, they're not just on the surface, they're on the outer surface of it. They get pushed to the outer surface. What's the distribution look like? Well, they're going to be evenly distributed. They're trying to show that in three dimensions here, but they're going to be evenly distributed just the same as they were in that first diagram that we saw. This is why, and you're going to see this in a video in just a few moments here. This is why. This is the question that... that uh, Everybody from the time they're, you know, 13 years old and hear a lightning storm, you know, it's a lightning storm, 
Where are you supposed to go? In your car. The car is a safe place to be in a lightning storm. Why? Well, because you got rubber tires. Wrong. It's not because you have rubber tires. Think about it. Okay, if lightning will go however many kilometers it is from the cloud to the car, then why can't it go through a half an inch of rubber between the car and the ground? Of course it can. The rubber has nothing to do with it. Rubber is an insulator, but it's not going to hold several million volts from going from a car to the ground. It has nothing to do with it. A car is a safe place to be in a lightning storm because of this. A car is a hollow, it's not a sphere, but it's a hollow metal object. A hollow metal object causes the electrons to go to the outer surface. And what happens as a result of that? Let's take a look for a second at the electric field inside. The electric field points this way towards number one, it points this way towards number two, and it points this way towards number three. What do you think happens to all three of those fields if we did a vector analysis? They cancel out. So the net electric field inside this surface is zero. That's why it's a safe place to be in a lightning storm in a car, because the net electric field inside that car is zero, and it has to be. It doesn't matter how many quadrillion electrons are on the surface of this car, the net electric field will be zero. Now, I, I think it would be rather scary if you were in a car that got struck by lightning. The electrical system may even fail. But you are safe, as long as, you're not, as long as you don't have your hand out the window and touching the roof of your car, then you're safe. Got it? Let's take a look at one final picture here now, one final diagram where we have what we call parallel plate capacitors. This is the plate that we saw earlier in one of the other diagrams, times two. We got two charged plates. One of them is positively charged. One of them is negatively charged. These are our parallel plates that we talked about a couple of days ago with our new electric field equation, right? E is equal to delta V over delta D. What happens here? Well, this one's a tiny bit trickier here, okay? We have the electrons going to the outer surface. This looks like the inner surface, right? That's not the inner surface. It's still the outer surface. It's just this side of the outer surface of the bottom plate. What do we have right here? Well, the protons go to the outer surface of the other one, right? No, they don't. The protons don't go to the outer surface of the other one. Remember, you've got an excess of protons on the top plate because it's positively charged or a deficiency of electrons. You've got an excess of electrons on the bottom plate. Here, the electrons move over here. They move to that side, to the outer surface, on the side that's closest to that positive plate. Here the protons don't move anywhere. Here the electrons are moving such that this side of the plate is positive. In other words, the electrons are actually moving up this way to make this side of the plate positive. Now, what happens to them? Well, the net charge, we're not necessarily saying the protons are evenly distributed here, but the net positive charge is evenly distributed on that top plate. What do we end up with? Well, if you take a look at the second diagram here, we end up with what we would expect, right? What we saw the other day. We have the electric field that acts between these two parallel plates going from positive to negative. Here's our field lines. But you can see at the edge here, right at the edge, we have these, these curved lines showing that at the edges, it's a non-uniform field. It's so what we call the edge effects. Why do we have that at the edge? Well, because the plate doesn't keep going forever. As long as the plate keeps going, it's a uniform field. Beyond that, it's a non-uniform field, right? So same kind of idea in terms of distribution, charge distribution, as we saw for all the other diagrams. But this one actually shows us the electric field shape and distribution that we had, that we saw last week, all right? So, quick little summary here, with all the diagrams that we saw, all the shapes that we saw, the charges, the excess charges, always go to the outer surface. They always go to the outer surface. Okay, no exceptions to that. Doesn't matter whether you get a solid conducting sphere, or a hollow conducting sphere, or a flat plate, or a pointy thing, it doesn't matter, all the charges 
all the excess charges, that is, always go to the outer surface. Now, if it's a nice uniform shape, like a conducting sphere, or whether it's solid or hollow, or whether it's a flat plate, okay, whatever, then they're going to be evenly distributed. But if it's that pointy thing where it's not so even, so it's not where it's not such a, a uniform shape, then what we're going to find is that the charges don't get evenly spaced. Rather, the charges get concentrated at the pointy part. Right? It's again, remember this, it's the finger. Right? As you're walking across the carpet, you get the shock coming out your finger because your finger is pointier than other parts of your body. Right? 